All right, I think we're going to get uh, get started. Um, welcome to the Berkman Klein Center to our last luncheon speaker series, Tuesday luncheon speaker series of the academic year 2017-2018. I'm Chris Babbitts from our Cyber Law Clinic. I'm honored to be able to introduce uh, my friends and colleagues, Jess Fjeld and Mason Quartz, who are going to have a great talk today, Art That Imitates Art, Computational Creativity and Creative Contracting. Uh, before we do that, just sort of the usual Tuesday housekeeping at the Berkman Client Center Lunch Speaker Series. We're being live streamed and recorded for posterity, so hello, Internet. And, um, oh, we're, we're not recording today. Sorry, we're live. Okay, just, oh, only recording, not live streaming. Okay, good, we got it. And, um, but if you, if you want to volunteer and ask a question, I think we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Just be mindful of that. Um, and as I mentioned, it's our last one of these, I think, for the academic year, so we are not likely to have public events through the summer months. We'll be picking back up again in September. Keep an eye on the website for future announcements. And uh, again, the series will start back up again in uh, September. Um, again, I'm really happy to be able to introduce Jess and Mason, uh, with whom I work in the Cyber Law Clinic. Jess Fjeld is our acting assistant director, a clinical instructor, and a lecturer at HLS who works on a lot of our matters related to copyright and IP. Um, Mason, uh, a clinical fellow who, uh, prior to joining us in the clinic, worked at the ACLU of Massachusetts and is a clerk in the District of Massachusetts, works on a pretty broad range of matters that touch on IP as well as online speech, uh, technology, has a real uh, firm data science background, and their interests have come together around a set of issues that I think really breached the gap between some of the research work that Berkman's doing on issues related to AI and sort of the nuts and bolts law practice work that we do in the clinic that relate to the intersection between AI and machine learning on the one hand and creativity, the, the creation of new copyrighted works on the other hand. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. So thanks very much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great to see such a crowded room. Um, so. The way we have this structured, um, I guess we hear that like back when all the lunch talks used to be in this room, we, people would go around and introduce themselves, but because it's so tight today, um, we want to make sure to leave a lot of time for a discussion, so we're not going to do that, but if you do speak up later in the discussion, if you could just preface your comment with your name and where you're coming to us from, that would be awesome. Uh, so the topic of today's talk uh, starts with this idea of computational creativity, which is a kind of catch-all term for any sort of um, AI or algorithmic uh, a driven or assisted creative work. And there's a lot of this going on already. Uh, we're going to show you a few examples later on, some of which are extremely cool. And this ranges from uh, humans who are creating digital art uh, with techniques that require high degrees of um, uh, comp computation to get the effects they want, to uh, AIs that with a little bit of coaxing and coaching from a person can generate on their own essentially novel pieces of artwork in a given style, even some we're going to talk about that generate their own scene. So this raises an incredible array of really deep philosophical questions uh, about what is the nature of creativity um, at what point does the human uh, cease to be the most important factor in generating the art? What does this say about our own human creativity, if it can be replicated um, uh, through machine learning, through AI? Um, what is the nature, what's the difference between training an AI on a body of works and me going to the museum and just looking at a bunch of art and getting expire, inspired and going home and painting something other than that the AI would do a much better job. Um, so these are like these incredibly broad and deep questions that go to the very nature of human creativity and our relationship with machines. And today we are not really going to be talking about those questions. Uh, instead, we're going to be talking about some real concrete, immediate legal issues, mainly when someone creates art uh, using uh, AI either as an assistant or as the main driver of the art. Um, who owns it and, and how can the rights in it be divided up? Yeah. Um, and we think that this is the right approach because while um, these big questions are very compelling, and I have to say they've been raised for like going on uh, over 50 years now, the Copyright Office was presented with the first um, purportedly computer authored work to be registered before 1965 because they put that question out there to the scholarly community, like how should we deal with computer authored works at first in 1965, um, which is incredible. So the law review articles have been bouncing around, people have been feeling these big questions, but um, 
what we're finding in our practice at the Cyberlock Clinic is that people are encountering um, real world, quite concrete questions about this today. Um, and for that reason, um, we think that the, the sort of concrete questions that they raise are just as interesting, if not more interesting, because we can delve um, really directly into the reality of how artists and engineers um, and computer scientists and neuroscientists and others are thinking about this work. Um, so as a result uh, of our first few forays into advising clients on, um, on issues related to AI-generated artworks, um, Mason and I together started to develop what we called uh, a schematic or an anatomy of AI-generated artworks. And the reason that we felt that this was so important is that almost no one, right, not the artists, not the lawyers, basically no one but the, the like engineers and computer scientists <laughs> that we were working with understood um, how these uh, algorithms actually worked. So um, what we have on the screen here is a sort of largely visible uh, uh, reproduction of that schematic, and Mason is going to tell you a little bit more about the various parts. Sure. So in the, in the upper left, we have the inputs, and these are uh, the training data, right? This is what your machine learning algorithm, and, and I should say as an aside here, we talk about this as AI and art. We're really focusing in this discussion on AI by way of machine learning. There are other potential ways to have AI to generate art, including like evolutionary algorithms. Uh, but in this case, we're assuming some sort of uh, input set not, that you're not starting from scratch. Uh, so you have the inputs. These are works that were generated probably by a human, maybe by another uh, computer system at some point in the past. Um, and it could be visual, it could be literary, it could be musical. I don't think we've seen sculptural yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's coming down the pipeline. Yeah, to some degree in the next Rembrandt, they did. That's true, because there's some, some the 3D paintings. scans, yeah. yeah. Yes, we yes. can. Yeah. As Mason um, goes through them. So yeah. it says the inputs provide training data for the trained yep. algorithm. And the learning algorithm, which says uh, analyzes inputs to produce the training algorithm, the learning algorithm, this is the machine learning algorithm. So this is your uh, your neural network or your symbolic lo logic uh, uh, network that is reading the inputs, whatever type they be, and uh, turning them into some sort of representation of relationships, what notes tend to follow what notes, what kind of colors a particular artist uses, uh, what sorts of scenes are pleasing to the eye. So um, the learning algorithm operates on the inputs and it produces what we're calling the trained algorithm. You might also call this uh, the model, the data model. Um, but this is the uh, essentially the statistical representation of everything the algorithm has learned by reading over the inputs. Again, could be a neural network, uh, could be uh, a Markov chain. You know, we're, we're really trying to stay as much as we can agnostic to the specific underlying technology. But it is a representation of some sort of uh, numerous works that have been ingested. It probably doesn't look much like them. If you were to uh, print out the code, you wouldn't see a bunch of Rembrandts in there. Um, but it is a representation, and that's... Yeah. That's important when we talk about the status of it as a derivative work. It may be hard to see here, but at the highest level of abstraction, you can think of it as like a just a data table, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what the like gray static behind trained algorithm is. It's just columns of data. Um, and then uh, the trained algorithm can produce outputs, and those outputs are generally of the same type as the input. So if it was trained on music, it's going to produce music. If it was trained on paintings, it was, it's going to produce paintings. Um, Optionally, you can have a seed material, so you can supplement it with seed material, which will influence the character of the output. So, um, for example, Deep, Google's Deep Dream, if anyone has seen this, uh, they trained an AI to recognize animal faces, and you put in an image, a photograph or a painting as a seed input, and it will transform that into the output based on what it has learned about detecting animal faces. It leads to some very uh, strange results sometimes. It um, essentially looks... If it looks at the input, identifies whatever might be an animal face, and then puts an animal face over it. Um, and you can run it through multiple times, and you get more and more and more animal faces, and deeper and deeper and deeper into what looks like a fairly hallucinatory experience. Um, if you haven't seen any of them, they're pretty incredible. They're not among the examples we have for yeah, you today. Yeah, that's true. Um, but so the and so one of the 
things that we think is really helpful about this model for bringing artists, developers, and lawyers together and getting on the same page is that uh, under the law, we think each of these can and should be treated as a separate work for the purposes of copyright. I mean, the inputs, those are paintings, uh, they're music. Most people would generally consider those to be copyrighted works. The outputs, which also resemble the inputs, it's pretty intuitive to people that those are works. But also, uh, the uh, machine learning algorithm is code, and code is to some extent copyrightable, although um, it kind of depends at the level of abstraction you're talking about. Um, and also, the trained algorithm, and this is where it gets really tricky, could be considered um, a derivative of the inputs and the trained algorithm in that uh, it requires information and it's pulling information about the creative aspects of those inputs and storing it in uh, some sort of statistical model. So mm -hmm. Jess is going to talk a little bit about what that means in terms of yeah. copyright. Yeah, but one thing we know about the trained algorithm is that in any case, there is at least some thin layer of copyright in compilations of data. So um, that's just worth a note. So there's potentially copyright in every single one of these things, including the seed material. Yeah. And I just, did we loop that up clearly with Deep Dream? So Deep Dream, the Deep Dream would be, the inputs would be the animal faces. The learning algorithm would be the Deep Dream software that Google developed. The trained algorithm is all set up on the internet, free for you to use. And the seed material would be whatever photograph you put in and, and tell Deep Dream, okay, now try to find animal faces in this. Um, okay. Questions, I guess, so what we'll do next is move into thinking about um, possible uh, models for copyright, how copyright could get involved with this, but questions about the basic architecture of this. Yeah. Is there a particular metaphor or way of explaining what you found was most efficient for explaining that? Yeah. This, this, this is graphic. the metaphor we yeah. came up with. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think essentially the thing that we found was the biggest piece was that was pulling apart the trained algorithm and really emphasizing that it's a separate work from either the inputs or the learning algorithm. And I think that the sort of key error that most people had when they were approaching it is that depending on which side they were aligned with, they either thought of the learning algorithm and the trained algorithm as coextensive or the inputs and the trained algorithm as coextensive. And so with those things lumped together, it's actually a lot harder to write a license for one of these pieces of artwork because um, you just uh, spend a lot of time arguing over what it is that you're talking about. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, okay. So this is a simplified version of that same chart um, that I think just makes it a little bit um, clearer as we start to, to add elements. So um, as I was just saying, the, the advantage of each of, of sort of breaking apart these pieces is that we can think about um, the ownership and licensing of each of these pieces individually um, with a lot more clarity once we sort of pull them apart um, into an anatomy like this. Um, and it gives, in our experience, the parties as they're trying to reach a resolution, um, more levers to pull because it gives them more flexibility, right? It's not as though you're trying to negotiate a license over who owns this entire system. Um, you can actually sort of tease apart, right? It's gonna be clear that like, whoever created or has subsequently acquired the copyright in the inputs owns that, whoever created or has subsequently acquired the copyright in the learning algorithm owns that, and then you just sort of come down to talking about um, the, the, um, the, the trained algorithm and the outputs that are created by the individual um, product. So, uh, however, um, it's relatively rare that we get to work um, with people, at, although we do have some now, um, at the stage before um, the trained algorithm has been, uh, the algorithm has been trained and the outputs are being produced. Typically it's after the fact. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of, uh, about the different scenarios for copyright infringement when this happens in the absence of a license. So in the green on the left, uh, you see what we call infringement by training. So um, when, the, when you scan or otherwise input um, copyrighted inputs um, through the learning algorithm to create the trained algorithm, that is typically going to be a violation of the reproduction right. You're typically going to be making a copy, essentially, of the inputs. And it might go a couple of ways. Um, 
it could be a transitory copy um, that's just made, you know, for the purpose of scanning, and then all you're left with is a sort of relatively clean data set, or depending on how uh, the algorithm is set up, either a full copy of the inputs or partial copies of the inputs, copies of certain areas could be left. Um, so in infringement by training, you might have as few as one instance of copying, um, or you might have very many and they might repeat. Um, so that's infringement by training. Anything else to say about that? Um, no. no. Okay. Uh, infringement by output um, is a separate category of, of the sort of sec major category of, of possible infringements. Um, and this one we think more about the derivative work right than we do <coughs> think about the reproduction right. Now, the reproduction right could be, could be caught here. Um, and although this is on the right, we're still largely thinking about how the inputs would be um, infringed by the outputs. Um, there, um, you could have, an, you could have a, a reproduction, a violation of the reproduction right if, say, you had such a poorly performing algorithm that it just straight up reproduced an input as an output. That would certainly be copyright infringement. Um, but even if you had a relatively well-functioning algorithm, if you had one that was design, designed to capture a whole like small chunks of the input works, you could still have a violation of the reproduction right um, uh, by comparing an input to an output that had reproduced one of those chunks in full. Um, more likely though, uh, if the um, developers of this system have put effort into it, um, what you're gonna see is not so much a reproduction of the inputs as a work that's very closely connected to them um, and uh, something that might be considered a derivative work. Um, and when we think about derivative works, the shorthand is sort of uses for which um, the original owner would have expected a expected you to get a license. Now that's a little bit tricky in the context of a new technology. Um, I don't think even a couple of years ago, anyone who was creating art was thinking about whether they would be licensing their work uh, for the purpose of training um, machine learning algorithms. Um, but certainly if the, the inputs and outputs look closely related, and we'll see a couple of examples as we move into discussion, um, there's a chance of an infringement uh, of the derivative work right. Um, and this is also a scenario where there could be very, very numerous instances of infringement, um, depending on how often the trained algorithm is run to produce an output, um, but it could easily run into the thousands or even the millions. Um, and because in copyright, uh, statutory damages go by each instance of infringement, uh, this could get expensive for um, the copyright infringer very fast. And the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is the trained algorithm, once trained, can easily be copied. Um, mm -hmm. So I could, um, you know, train an, uh, an algorithm on some inputs. If I put that up on GitHub or something like that, other people could download it and start violating copyright. Now, who's responsible for that? Are, are they violating copyright if they've done, do I, am I liable for contributory infringement because I enabled their infringement? Mm -hmm. Uh, by training on copyrighted data. It gets really complex when we get to um, tools that produce art um, or AIs that produce art and themselves are easily reproducible. All right. So um, we're, we want to spend the remaining sort of 35 minutes of this lunch um, presenting you with a series of examples um, of this kind of work and um, encourage you um, to share your reactions and your questions with us as we do. So we have four examples, um, and this is the first one. Do we, I assume we want to look at the video. I think we right? should play the okay. video. It's Let's really see. cool. Um, so this is a still from the video. Um, do you want to go yeah. over what it is? Well? So this is a system that has been trained to recognize uh, different patterns, so water, fire, uh, flowers, I think a few others. Mm -hmm. And um, what's really interesting about this is that um, it has been trained on these images. It's created a trained algorithm that can um, recognize these patterns and replace them in images. Uh, but as seed material, instead of using a static image, it uses video. Uh, so in this case, the transformation is happening in real time. And Um, and so this raises some, I think you have to set it up to mirror. Um, yeah, I'll work on it while okay. I talk. Um, 
So this raises some really interesting questions, and I know I said we would not get into the deep philosophical stuff, but I can't help myself just a little <laughs> bit um, about the the nature of inspiration. If um, if I observe something and I draw a copy of it, and if what I'm observing is itself copyrighted, that might be a violation, and if what I'm observing is just like a natural landscape or something, it probably wouldn't. Um, I'll talk while this goes on yeah. in the background. Um, it goes for a while. The, um, the copy, the representation that's in my mind in transit between my vision and me writing something down isn't a copy. And this is something that has been recognized in other instances in copyright law. For example, in the Cablevision case where uh, a very transitory copy that was made temporarily for the purpose of providing um, cable access – uh, which, I, which DVR which are, services, DVR services yeah. right, which lasted for 1.2 seconds, was considered to be too transitory to count as being fixed in a medium. So what happens when we have AIs that can read things in in real time and immediately convert them? Uh, does this create a challenge for, uh, for copyright because essentially these systems can act so quickly that, the, that maybe any copy they're making is, is, is transitory or ephemeral? Um, so this, uh, is a art piece called Gloomy Sunday, um, and I'll skip a little bit ahead. Yeah, so, um, this is an AI that's watching live this footage over here, and it's for a, f a few instances. The first one was trained only on seascapes, um, so you could see it was interpreting that, like, tablecloth, um, as seascapes here. It's been trained only on images of fire. I just think this is like the most amazing thing that's ever happened to a phone charger. You're <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. um, only on sky. I think Jess really summed this summed this up very well in that, well, one that this would not happen without AI tools, mm -hmm. and it transforms a phone charger, which is I think. Jess called it the most quotidian image you could imagine into this incredibly beautiful um, seascape. And uh, I think this is a great example because it shows how valuable these tools are, um, but also raises some questions about um, uh, if this were being run on uh, something that was copyrighted and not just a pic, you know, not just a video of, uh, of someone moving their keys around. Um, well, there you know, could be copyright in it, right? So this, true. he's, uh, the artist who made this, he's doing the live video on the left. So he's going to have the copyright in that. But we would have concerns about where he got these flower images, right? Like, it's possible mm -hmm. that he pulled the images of the sea and the sky and the flowers um, from, the, from public domain or CC0 sources. Um, but if he didn't, um, then we have, we have right. questions. Th about, then we're in the... Um, There are there so filters like Photoshop filters yeah. are generally treated as tools. Um, so wouldn't be treated generally any different than. What do you observe? Wouldn't be treated any differently than what? Uh, wouldn't wouldn't be treated um, any differently than any other sort of artistic tool. You would look at basically the um, whether there was a, a <coughs> modicum of creativity. Um, whether the whether there's substantial similarity between the input and the output. I mean, before any of that, you would look at whether the input was even copyrighted in the first place. Um, I think that the difference here is that those filters are uh, hand-coded. They're not trained on existing works. Uh, this was trained by feeding it a bunch of existing works, some of which may have been copyrighted, some of which may have not. And so there's this potential for copyright violation by way of training as well as copyright by way of producing the output. Mm -hmm. I also think the different outputs raise different scenarios, right? Like I think um, the seascapes, it's very, and the, and the sky and even the fire, it's very hard in any of those three scenarios to imagine that you might recognize an image of fire um, in the output, whereas the, the flower one I think is a little bit different where it's possible that someone could say, like, hey, that's my daisy, right? Like, I see, I, like, I took a photo of the daisy with that exact same lighting, and it's being reproduced, like, over that area where, where the person's hand is now. Um, uh, so in the sort of sea, 
fire sky scenarios, I think we have questions about like infringement by training more so than uh, infringement mm. by output. Yeah. As a person who's not trained in art, why would I go to mass art? Why would I go to music and art? Yeah. New York, I mean, this is amazing what you can do. I mean, I have a leftover drawer where I can pull out stuff and do it. Yeah. The problem I have with this is that if you go, I go like to the Whitney Museum in New York and I see like a, a Basquiat or a Schnabel or a Jackson Pollock or something, what do you do with, you know, this is obvious, you know, seascape, sky, things uh -huh. that you recognize, but what do you do with the area of modern art? And also, what do you do, how do you compare something like a Picasso, something that comes from Sotheby's and Christie's with the art world, with something that you could make in an afternoon with a really cool algorithm? So, what, 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 what weight does the art world give to AI versus, uh, like, actual, <laughs> ta you know, talent? artist behind this is this guy Memo Octon, who I think is doing a computer science PhD, um, but is also clearly a like very creative person and interested in making art. Um, he owns this algorithm, right? He has not made it freely available, so none of us are in a position now where we can feed in our own um, inputs to this and and do it. he has a number of videos on on vimeo and i encourage you to google them and check out the other ones um but right now i think the way that you would see this in a museum is that the museum would acquire this from him right would acquire one of the finished videos okay. or uh, acquire like a piece of performance art where he would do it live um but yeah right right now to use this algorithm without we don't have access to it someone got access to it to use the algorithm without his permission would also be an instance of copyright infringement yeah um so i don't i don't i'm not aware that he's trained them on anything but images but it would be totally fascinating to see um if he you know trained them on a series of basquiat paintings <laughs> a series of basquiat paintings or something like that mm -hmm. uh, yeah there are groups that have done this with your questions group out of tubingen has made deep art you can go online at deepart.io Okay. It's a very similar mechanism with style transfer. So this is, you can kind of divide up a lot of this work into style transfer and generative camps, where style transfer takes the style of a large set of images here, like with flowers. You could do this all the colors that are publicly available on Depart, and it renders new content in those styles, like a filter. Right? So here he's providing new content, as opposed to an algorithm outputting purely generative novel works that don't require some sort of input to be rendered mm -hmm. in a trained style. So there's two uh, different works So two notes on that. One, if you go to deepart.io, you can make your own. You can put in both the like style that you want and the image that you want. Um, so fun thing to play around with. And two, Sarah, will you introduce yourself? It's for the recording. Sure. Yes. Everyone, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm Sarah Shretman. I'm a PhD student in computational neuroscience at MIT, and I do computational art as well. Oh, thanks. Oh, I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one? Yeah. Let's go on. All right. Find it so again. this is a uh, this is a song called Daddy's Car uh, that was written using the Flow Machines software. Um, so this is software that was developed by Sony. Um, it is uh, generative um, uh, generative music producing uh, AI. This particular case, uh, so Flow Machines is really interesting. It, it is um, designed not to just be purely generative, um, but also to assist uh, composers in making their in making music. So it's really intended for uh, human AI collaborative art. So let's listen okay. to a little bit. I think it's actually going to be from my computer, so it's going to be kind of quiet. Apologize. Have a, anyone have a guess as to whose body of work this was trained on? <laughs> oh, oh sorry. It? Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah. It was trained on uh, the Beatles catalog. It uh, listened and processed the music and then also uh, input the lyrics textu textually. Yeah. Um, and so 
this song was written, the, the melody was composed by the AI, uh, the lyrics were written by the AI, and then a human arranged it and, and produced the recording. Uh, so this raises some very different questions than the pr previous one in that the inputs and the outputs are very recognizable. And here, this kind of question of derivative work um, from the input to the output stage as opposed to copying from the, the input to the trained algorithm is, uh, it, you know, becomes an additional layer. So, Jess, did you want to talk a little bit about yeah. those questions? I mean, I think, so... Um, we, there's a number of sort of similar examples of um, AI, art generating AI systems uh, that are trained on a single artist's work, or in this case, a single group's work. Um, and uh, they raise some compelling questions, particularly in the aftermath of the decision in the blurred lines case, um, which probably many of you are familiar with, but that's the case um, about the Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams song, Blurred Lines, that um, the Marvin Gaye's heirs uh, brought a copyright infringement suit uh, alleging that it infringed one of Marvin Gaye's number one Billboard hits. Um, and the um, Second Circuit decided and the Supreme Court denied certiorari in a decision um, that essentially while um, there was significant dispute among the musicologists as to whether, I think that there was basically evidence that like no, there was no single like one note to a second note identical in the song. Uh, the overall look and feel, the jury was was justified in finding that there was copyright infringement nonetheless, um, because essentially it, they, it copied the style, the instrumentation, um, some sort of the movements of the themes in the songs. Um, and so you can imagine that in a world where uh, Blurred Lines is um, a copyright infringement of that Marvin Gaye song, um, that this could easily be considered um, copyright infringement of um, one or more Beatles songs. <laughs> um, the other thing that's really interesting is here, um, this was, so Flow Machine is a, is a music AI that's developed by a subsidiary of Sony. Um, so I think that the work in this case was licensed. Um, and I, I'm not aware that any of the living Beatles participated in this, but you could also imagine a scenario where um, the artist whose input is training the AI was actually directly involved and interested in collaborating um, with the engineers to figure out, to, to sort of train an AI deliberately to reproduce their works. Um, and we've been thinking about that scenario in particular as a really interesting case, a sort of paradigmatic case in many ways um, for joint ownership of both the trained algorithm and the outputs um, if both the designers of the um, learning algorithm and the inputs are deliberately collaborating to create a new work. Um, so we think that that is a, a sort of exciting possibility. So any questions or thoughts on this yeah. one? philosophical uh, sort of discussion, which is, how do you conceptualize the difference between inspiration and influence <laughs> when it comes to musical creation? Right. So exactly. under the law of copyright, neither one of those is a violation, right? There has to be copying, um, which means um, that uh, there is enough similarity between the original work and the copy um, to say that uh, this was... Uh, lacked, um, that, that it actually took wholesale creative elements from the original <laughs> rather than uh, just being kind of one in the uh, kind of corpus of works that maybe influenced an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not a great answer because it's not a technical hard line. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think, think this, yeah. sorry. So the, the interesting <laughs> thing though, um, so there's this elaborate test for um, infringement and copyright, that the first question you ask is access, right? Did they have access to the work that's allegedly infringed? Um, and then the second question is this substantial similarity test that Mason raises, which has both an extrinsic and an intrinsic element. The extrinsic one says, break it all down, um, look at every piece, see where there might be infringement. And the intrinsic one says, okay, like, juror, as a general sense, when you listen to these two pieces of music side by side, do you, like, have a gut feeling that there's infringement? Um, and... The interesting thing is that when you have an AI, at least if it is an explainable AI and if its creators have um, documented um, what they, what material they trained it on, 
there's no question about access. And there's also potentially no question about the extrinsic test. You would just be able to have the AI output its answers to that, right? Um, and so it's really interesting to think about what, in what ways copyright law was designed around this conclusion that the human brain, the human creator is a black box and to what degree we've actually romanticized that notion um, and uh, to what degree it, we, it even like forms part of the foundation for like what is creative, right? Like whether the, the fact that an AI could output like, so I used like 13% of this piece and I used 100% of the drums from this piece if it could tell us all of that, would we come to the conclusion that it was not a creative act, right? Imagine on the, as kind of the counter example, a human with a photographic memory, an artist who could say, who could recite to you every piece of work they had ever seen and tell you when they painted, yes, it is 0.1% this work that I saw yeah. 25 years ago. Yeah. You know, um, would we value that person's artwork less? Mm -hmm. sort of the percentages of probably, probably not. That's a, that's <laughs> a, that's a, <laughs> we don't ask them to. Even if they could, we wouldn't ask them to. But this is, you know, copyright uh, is based around this assumption that at a certain level of de there's a certain level of detailed information we just can't get, and that's why we have these fuzzy tests about gut feelings. Now we have tools coming along that make that fuzziness extremely, extremely clear. And this, uh, and we'll talk about a little bit, a little bit about this at the end of the presentation kind of calls into some of the basic uh, presumptions about why we have the copyright doctrine at all. Yeah. In art school, most people start by learning from copies. Or they make original works. Mm -hmm. That's training. Mm -hmm. That's... <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, certainly we don't... Uh, if, if that training were extremely <coughs> evident in an output that they claimed was their own, was original and creative, and the underlying work was copyrighted, uh, that would be a violation. Um, this yeah, just, of, you know, A, painting in the style of B kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and I mean, there, there are many things that are uh, well recognized. The, uh, you know, students of, you know, uh, famous artists are known often, are often highlighted for having similar but subtly different uh, styles. And I've done some of the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yes. Um, so let's say a human artist decides then off of the AI to be inspired by something, but it's a little too similar. How deep does the copyright protection go then? So you're talking about how, how like deep or thin is the copyright protection in a work by an AI? Yeah, exactly. And then yeah. if someone infringes on that, then are they infringing on something two or three years ago? So our position um, would be at least as of now, that there are no, um, there really aren't any AI systems that we're aware of that are sort of equivalent to human authors. And there's a number of reasons that that's far out. That the Copyright Office essentially we would say like still doesn't have to answer that question it asked in 1965, like is there, um, what do we do about computer authored works? The, the biggest thing is that like um, no computer as yet experiences that like spark of inspiration. It, Computers only create at the behest of humans, right? You always have to press the like go button, make an output. Um, but um, so right now, all of these like AI authored works, which are really human authored works with substantial AI assistance, um, are just human authored works, and they get the same level of copyright protection that a human authored work without AI assistance would get. Um, so that may be if if they're very creative, that's like thick copyright protection, right? If they are more like a bare data set, that's thin copyright protection. Um, but then I think your second question was sort of like, um, if the AI work was infringing of copyright, could the copy, the like piece inspired by it be infringing not only of its copyright, but like the ones back? Possibly, yeah, yeah. And, and I think also with this idea of uh, AI assisted human generation, uh, I think that might in the future complicate matters of the question of finding substantial similarity because if an AI suggests um, a tune and then a human takes that and, and arranges that um, and maybe a, a band plays that, uh, you have um, uh, you have an AI that maybe is a kind of a contributory infringer here. There was no, uh, there was no intent um, 
and certainly no willfulness maybe on the human person, but what if by looking under the hood, the human could have seen uh, that this was trained on a single, uh, was trained all on the Beatles, is that person now a willful uh, infringer such that um, uh, someone could get statutory damages? All right. Yeah, guys. The Google advertising algorithm as like sort of slightly manipulating all artists who use internet search. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Recommendation engine for like what kind of content you're seeing. Um, totally. So, in the interest of time, I want to shift us forward because we have two more examples, and they're both so cool. Mm -hmm. um, Can I so. Uh, uh, class action against for manipulating them? Or I think it would be all of society. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting to think about like what yeah. suit before. Yeah, I like, don't think that would be copyright. It wouldn't be copyrighted for it would, I don't know, like fraud. Fraud at some level. Yeah. Uh, uh, you'd have to have harm. Unwanted influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or some kind of you know um, <laughs> consumer protection violation yeah. at some point, but. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to jump in, but this is, I'm finding myself much more fascinated by the, the, the kind of quiddity of reproduction rather than inspiration, than, mm -hmm. uh -huh. which is not what I expected at all. But um, So how does it become, or could it be the same thing? I mean, <coughs> Google is crawling the web all the time, yeah. right? Um, and there is some analytic process that's taking place there. Um, can't one imagine, I'm just interested in this the reproduction problem of the training data that, <clears throat> that, um, that ultimately produce an algorithm and the question of whether there's infringement in that, yeah. that inheres in that. And I'm really interested in how suddenly reproduction seems like an impoverished concept for what's going on here. Yeah. Um, like how, couldn't, couldn't we imagine um, a, an example like the first example you shared? Um, in which programmatically what's going on in terms of the training data is really very similar computationally to what any, you know, um, web crawler does. Mm -hmm. um, ha, where, where does this become reproduction instead of some other kind of so analytic experience? One way around that is to concede reproduction <coughs> but say that it's fair use mm -hmm. uh, anyway, mm -hmm. right? So this is, <coughs> this is something that has happened with a lot of um, computationally created compilations of information is that courts have said, well, it's transformative <laughs> enough, it creates a new enough purpose, and this is true of, um, of indexing search results to say that it's fair use. Yeah. So that's one answer. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's right, and I think it sort of holds true with this as well. Uh, and the big, in our sort of schema, I think the two ways you'd think about it is like the daddy's car on the one hand, where all the inputs are one artist, and really the goal is to create an output that is essentially like not that transformative, right? Like you want mm -hmm. a song that sounds like a Beatles song. And the other one is something like the Gloomy Sunday piece where the goal is to create something that looks like a seascape, but not any particular seascape, just a seascape. Or, um, and this one's not a great example, but um, so like a, a sort of massively multiple artist input where the goal is to teach it like everything that, uh, for instance, a cityscape could look like. And then it, this one is, doesn't have inputs like that, which is what's cool about it. But um, uh, then it just it doesn't reproduce any particular cityscape. There, we think with the massive, massively multiple artist inputs, it's much more likely to be a fair use, at mm -hmm. least as far as the reproduction. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. You know things like, say, the blues, that, that uh, some things that occurred like pre, it's almost like original seeds, but like original music. Mm -hmm. or original, uh, I don't know, original anything that is just sort of in the common sphere and then somebody does something and copyrights it and then it's like basmati rights. Now, if you want it, it it's copyrighted by you know, GMOs, but artwork can potentially, that can potentially be done with music and just um, co-opting like um, indigenous or African or some, some type of music, and then all of a sudden, you've got a copyright on something that isn't even yours. So I think there, there are a couple of copyright doctrines that I think try to address that. Um, so one is that if you can 
prove that something uh, existed has existed for more than more seventy than years or so on. Yeah. Uh, the exact time is constantly changing. Uh, you know, you can say it is actually in the public domain. The other is this idea of oh, sens affaires. There are certain themes, and this can be in literature, in painting, in music, that are foundational elements of a genre mm -hmm. and can't be copyrighted. Mm -hmm. I think that you raise a good point about uh, cultural barriers because, um, you know, what is an apparent sens affair to a judge who has read a lot of Shakespeare may not be apparent as sens affair if that judge hasn't read, um, yeah, or I would say, or hasn't of read a, like, indigenous writings. Yeah, uh, so there yeah. might be I, the, definitely kind of the cross cultural barrier is a big issue. All right, I really want to get yeah. these two other examples okay. in. So let's do Painting Fool really quick and then go okay. to the next so one. Okay, so Painting Fool uh, was trained on. Um, Painting Fool is the name of an algorithm. Name, name of an algorithm that was trained on hundreds of thousands of different pieces of artwork to learn uh, very broad style. So not like the style of Matisse, but uh, impressionistic. Uh, charcoal sketching, so on. And then it was also uh, trained to recognize what city skylines look like. And so now what it can do is it can do automatic scene generation in that not only does it generate the style to transfer onto the scene, it generates the scene itself. Um, so here we have an AI that is really in the classification of generative in that there is uh, it can essentially output something uh, not wholly creative, because you can't say, draw me a field, it has to be a cityscape, uh, but it can do a cityscape, it can do it in multiple styles, and it's very hard now to trace that back to an individual human spark of creativity. So this is, a nut, this is, a, this is one of, I think, what we might call uh, sort of the, a hard case if you wanted to produ produce copying, or an easy case mm -hmm. if you wanted to say there is no copying, that this is all fair use. Yeah. So I'm going to say, let's set this one up, and the next mm -hmm. one up, and then yep. we'll... The first step was to study the works of Rembrandt in order to create an extensive database. We gathered the data from his collection of paintings from many different sources, including 3D scans and upscale images using a deep learning algorithm. Because a significant percentage of Rembrandt paintings were portraits, we analyzed the demography of the faces in these paintings, looking at factors like gender, age, and head direction. The data led us to the conclusion that the subject should be a portrait of a Caucasian male with facial hair between 30 and 40 years old, in dark clothing with a collar, wearing a hat, and facing to the right. From there, we started to extract features only with faces that were related to that specific profile. And we had to create a whole painting from just data. And we used uh, statistical analysis and various algorithms to extract the features that make Rembrandt Rembrandt. We took parts of the face and we started to compare them. And then, based on this, we're able to create a typical Rembrandt eye or nose or mouth or ear. After generating the features, we were focusing on the face proportions. We used an algorithm that can detect over 60 points in a painting. We were able to align the faces and to estimate the distance between the eyes, the nose and the mouth and the ears. A painting is not a 2D picture, it's 3D. You can see the canvas, you can see the brushes, and that's what makes the painting come alive. A hive map is essential to make the painting a painting. We incorporated the height map into the painting and printed on a 3D printer that uses a special paint base, UV ink. It printed many layers, one on top of the other, which resulted in the height and texture of the final painting. sometimes a magical moment to see a painting for the first time. Even if it's computer generated, for me it is something special. I would have believed if I would saw it in a museum that it would have been a, a real Rembrandt, uh, just one I haven't seen before. It will be interesting to see Rembrandt looking at it. He will be happy that there are people trying to understand him and trying to create something out of that, so I think he will be happy. The next Rembrandt makes you think about where innovation can take us. What's next?
the black box concept of how creativity is done is romanticized. I think we're also seeing here another kind of romanticism for like the idea that we could, if only we were able to measure at a high enough precision the world, that we would be able to like predict the future or like create new things that are the same. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I think we, at the, while we problematize the sort of black box romanticism, we might also want to be problematizing this. Concept. I totally agree, and I was actually, I had never thought of it when I was watching this video before, but just until right now, that like, the people, the people in this video were like, we looked at the data, and it led us to paint a picture of ourselves. Yeah. Like they, like, like a bunch of like white males between 30 and 40 decided to paint a white male between 30 and 40 on the basis of the data. It's mm -hmm. so right, but right. it's science, so we, yeah, so I think that that's what Totally <laughs> absurd. Yeah. I'd love to know more uh, about this whole black box romanticizing thing because as a singer songwriting songwriter myself like I th I think that beyond the the extensive you know um, inspiration that I got from 28 years of listening to all kinds of songs that I have no reference uh, of but there is also a way of interpreting life through music that I can't describe necessarily but if you tell me, if you tell me to write a song that's a Beatles, like, I, I would do that. But if you tell me write a happy song or write a sad song or write something about grief or something about love, or, uh, that is comes back to how I interpret life through notes and through music. So is there a way to get, because I know that some robots now have feelings and stuff. So is there, like, a bringing wait, together? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like they're, they're starting to, to, to humanize them as much as possible. Yeah, so, so that, is the there, painting fool actually yeah. learned to detect, that's the one, right? Yeah. Learned to detect emotion. There's a very good paper called uh, Automatic Scene Generation with Intent, and then... Um, the follow-up paper, Automatic Scene Generation with More Intent, um, uh, which is about, uh, they they hooked the painting fool up to a facial recognition uh, fa facial recognition algorithm that could detect whether people were happy or sad, and then it would paint it in uh, a happy, kind of cartoony uh, features if and the person colors, was detected as like being happy with bright colors, stuff, and yeah. uh, a more like blue, impressionist kind mm -hmm. of uh, painting if, they, uh, if it detected that people were sad. Um, now that, of course, is an algorithm that was told by human trainers. This is what a happy person looks like. This is what a sad person looks like. We're still extremely far away, both from humans having feelings. I think what we're actually doing is we're projecting a lot of our feelings onto onto robots. Robots don't have emotions um, by any stretch, I would say. Um, but I do think, you know, you also raise a good point, which is. I can I could I could train an AI on uh, t hundreds of thousands of pieces of art more than I could ever see in my lifetime, but it would still only know art. It wouldn't have any other experiences, and we're very far away from what we call AGI, so artificial general intelligences, um, which could uh, expand beyond a very specific narrow domain that they're looking at and learn from multiple different experiences and actually start to be spontaneous. Anybody we haven't heard from yet have questions? I know, I haven't seen a project like this that sort of intent, like, takes the posture of appropriation art in intending to, like, very closely approach its inputs. In fact, generally, I think the sort of intent in these systems is, to, and, like, the sort of definition of success on the part of their creators is to, like, achieve some distance from the inputs. Um, so... I think there yeah. are similar pieces of art, though, where, for, for example, the intent might be um, to, for instance... Uh, create discussion about the relationship mm -hmm. between human and artificial creativity. Mm -hmm. And in that case, 
Uh, much like the satire and parody cases under ca copyright, you need a degree of rec uh, recognizability yeah. in order for that to be a meaningful discussion. Uh, so I think that yeah. that could be a, a. I think that is happening with some artists. Yeah, actually, that's a good example of that. Is the very first example we showed you of the water. Um, Memo mm -hmm. Octon says he calls the series "Learning to See" um, because his point is like a political one about like the AI only like when it looks at the. Um, uh, Phone charger. Like phone charger or whatever. It only knows about water, so it only sees water. Mm -hmm. um, and so he thinks, like, similarly, like, it, as people, we if, like, our background is whatever, we see, we only see ourselves and the things we're... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that, that what you just showed us is actually very much, um, you know, it's not as in the line of, like, appropriation, but it is in the line of, I mean, the fact that they call it creating the next... Rembrandt yeah. Yeah. is in in fact asserting that we can we can create uh, works by people who are no longer <laughs> alive and that that I think it, it you know obviously at this point Rembrandt's works are unless I, I, I mean I would think they're in the public domain uh, so I don't know about private, what private ownership has to say in that context but, um, like, I guess, you know, and, and so one can say, it, it would be interesting, I think, to hear from you guys about how, how taking, you know, why would you say that this is a, the next Rembrandt, where does the, you know, ownership fall for this if all the images are in the public domain, but ING commissioned these people to make this, um, and also what, you know, uh, what does this, you know, when, when you have, you know, even if we say, okay, it's all in the public domain, this is a, we've created a new painting, how does that relate to, like, um, you know, as we think about all the, the sort of struggles to authenticate original works? And, and then juxtaposing with the ability by certain entities to create, in dis, you know, other than, I guess, by timing and, and dating of the uh, paint and that sort of thing, yeah. indistinguishable stylistic. Well, I don't, so I think, so a couple of things yeah. about that. <laughs> I, I, we use the next Rembrandt example in part because I think that that video shows you really well. I mean, there is like machine learning involved yeah. here, but it also shows you how intensely hands-on it was for the yeah. people, right? Like there are a lot of people involved there making a lot of the yeah. key decisions, right? The, the AI did not decide to paint a white male yeah. in his 30s to 40s with a hat and a collar. Yeah. People decided that. Yeah. And then they worked very incrementally with the AI to like settle on an eye, settle on a mouth, decide the distance between those things. So that's part of why we showed that example. Um, so I think in that instance, the copyright is going to go to those people unless of course yeah. It's a work made for hire for ING, in which case ING gets the copyright. Um, but then, sorry, should we just... Oh, I just know we're like yeah. pretty close to... Yeah. I just wanted to get like a couple people who haven't had a chance to okay. ask a question yet. Uh -huh. And I teach digital fabrication, and um, my students are super interested in 3D scanning until they become reproductions, they're just not interested anymore. And I think a lot of what we're talking about here is kind of early in terms of copyright because I think it's ultimately not that interesting for artists to reproduce things. It might be interesting to study, as we said earlier, to make reproductions, to study a style, or how you might technically do something. But I do find that this idea of seed material, um, most of my students aren't grabbing things that are already available. They're way more interested in creating something original and then using the algorithm as some kind of tool. I think this fascination with the gadget soon becomes very old. And I think there's this big fear in art school too of this uh, so-called democratization of creativity where anyone can write music, anyone can make art. But I think at the end of the day, if there's no context, it's like data just remains data, only becomes information when it's contextualized. I think the same with art. Good art is something that has been contextualized and has actually some kind of meaning. And just the last thing I wanted to add is that I think there's a real um, gap in digital liter literacy. And a lot of the people that are using these tools are very educated in programming and they can see behind the scenes what's going on, but for an artist, it's a very high learning curve. So they're trying to use this as some kind of tool. 
And I find that most of my students are just trying to hack the system anyway. So it's sort of interesting to see what, what they're doing with this technology as opposed to what, um, you know, uh, computer science PhD uh, people are doing or, or engineers. It's just a very different world, you know? Yeah, I think that's a, like, a great perspective and also sort of connects to how I was going to answer your second question, which is that, like, when we see a, like, really low-res image of that, like, next Rembrandt, right, I think to us it, like, the whole, then the video is designed with the music, whatever, to make you go, like, whoo, like, oh, my God, it's, like, indistinguishable from all those other, like, tiny, fuzzy images of Rembrandts that we saw. <laughs> but um, I think that if you or your students or art historians looked at that, I, I have, I think it's a very open question what, how, whether people who truly care about Rembrandt would find that painting to yeah. be compelling, right? Because... <laughs> You know, like it, right? Well, also, like just because, just because the lighting is similar is a sort of average of like other lighting conditions in Rembrandt paintings doesn't mean that it like has the same emotive affect on us. And just because they reprint like three D painted the canvas doesn't mean that like they actually got it right about like where the build up should be and where the brush strokes should be. So I think it's a sort of open question as to whether, and I think the question. It's an open question, but the answer is likely no. If somebody who was like a true scholar of Rembrandt would look at that and mm -hmm. say it has any, it's like anywhere even close. One thing that then it becomes more. I mean, there's no way they can because of the carbon dating. But yeah, yeah. what if it's a modern it artist instead of Rembrandt, there. and what you have is a forgery engine? Maybe. Well, I think that uh, I mean right now. So a lot of the things we've looked at, I, I think all the examples we've looked at today, I would classify like largely under the idea of being they're tech demos these are not yeah. being used they're not being put forward as we're making art they're being put forward as we're testing out techniques we're showing what is possible we're learning about the process of machine learning mm -hmm. and so i agree with you 100 percent that there isn't a lot of interest as like kind of like art qua art here um i do think they perform some of the pieces uh, we've seen, and I think the Painting Fool gets into this a bit, and the, certainly this discussion about the next Rembrandt, I think it provokes conversations about uh, the relationship of art and, um, you know, as tools become easier to use, um, what, is there like a kind of like a smaller degree of creativity that is needed to create these works, or is it just like a smaller amount of effort, but the same amount of creativity, and if so, what do we feel about that? It's going to reproduce, and then right. Steve Wright comes and, you know, yeah. um, hacks the system, so. Um, so I know. Should we take one last yeah, question, maybe? Can maybe? It's take... Rachel's birthday. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, I should take Rachel's question. <laughs> I was just going to build on the question of mag magnetic tape and uh, ask if there are other precedents or other technologies where this conversation has been had before for computer-aided design or... Uh, just being able to take pictures of paintings, but if you're worried if you can take a picture of something, then will that allow you? Being able to take pictures of anything, actually, yeah. when 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 photography uh, first became widely available, there was a question about whether ph photographs could ever be copyrighted because they said a human is not generating the art; all the human is doing is choosing the subject. Yeah, yeah. and even like, and who, if a copyright could exist in a photograph, who would own it? Like, would it be the camera? That question was really asked. Yeah. Or the monkey. Right. Yeah. yeah, it seems like it seems kind of silly looking back. Like, well, of course, like photography is a very creative art, and people people own the copyright of photography. But yeah, that was that was a question that uh, had to be decided in the courts. Uh, so I think yes, we do have precedent for this kind of. Uh, I don't want to call it a crisis because I think that overstates it, but this kind of struggle with uh, with applying copyright to new technology. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.